take off my watch because uh, we did it all while we were waiting. So I think we were supposed to do talk for 15, 20 minutes, but I think we can do two hours, so we have to be very careful. It's, it's wonderful to see you. I'm obviously not used to using this. It is, it's not only a, an honor to be here with you, I have to tell you, uh, to some degree, it, uh, I'm here out of a sense of duty, it is a strange thing to say. Um, it's, and it's a little difficult, you know, I, I joke, but this, I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk to you about about Nikki Winton and about the Kinder Transport, and uh, it's I come at the story from from a bit of a, a different angle, and it's a sense of victory to be here to some degree because uh, my dad died in 1992, uh, uh, was the sole survivor of his family. He was in Theresienstadt uh, Theresienstadt for for four years. Uh, my mum eat, um, and other things. George and uh, Yivka and Mummy, uh, Sasha Gardner, uh, who, um, who died very recently, uh, was the sole survivor of, of her family. Uh, she was sent to uh, Auschwitz, Birkenau, and um, when, the, when the Soviet uh, troops were closing in, she was part of the death, death march to uh, Baden Nelson. Um, uh, in 1945, she was uh, she was liberated by Canadian and, and British uh, forces. It was after the war that uh, she met Daddy. I was born in Prague in 1948, and they they survived. Uh, uh, they survived for the Nazis, but they decided to run away from the communists. So we came to Canada in 1951, and it's interesting because um, Mummy's way of dealing with Searing pain and trauma was denial. Canada was the future, and we were not talking about the past. We were moving forward, and her um, extraordinary and daddy's work ethic um, made that happen. And for the third time, they created a, a new life. But mummy never spoke of it. I couldn't get her to be interviewed for the show project. No. Uh, it, the, the trauma was, there was post-traumatic stress disorder, and she wouldn't, uh, but that was her way of dealing with it. She also uh, didn't uh, tell us, tell me, that we were Jewish until I was 16 years old. Wow. And that's a whole other story. So um, I have come to realize that that's when I'm talking about duty. It was my duty to come, part of my bearing witness, uh, to honor to honor those who died and to celebrate those who who survived. <laughs> and you very well know a lot about survival. It's my can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I always feel a little guilty when I sort of take center stage because I had a very, very lucky life. My parents put me onto the Kindle transport. I really didn't realize what it entailed when my father told me, as they put me on the boat because they had to get me to England separately. Um, that we would see each other in Palestine, which they expected to get certificates for, and we would be, meet there. I fully expected that to happen. Do you think they believed it? Do you think your father really believed it when he said They were hoping for it because they knew that certificates would come in within about a year and a half to two, and at that point they didn't think the war would break out. We left Prague and went to Poland because my father said he had no intentions waiting under German occupation for our certificates to come in. So they were very much aware 
And I remember my father also telling me that he thought was probably the only person who believed when they had the Munich Accord and it was said that the Sudetenland was his last territorial demand. He said most probably Mr. Chamberlain is the only one who believed it. <laughs> and I remember that quite vividly. Because, you know, it was but a matter of time. And I think when they told me that they expected to see me again in Eretz Israel, um, I fully believed it. And in England, I was rather fortunate because we were a group of people. There were four of us from Teplitz where I grew up. We were with friends and kids to be with their peer group is terribly important for them. I really can't say I was particularly lonely, sure I missed my parents. But, but it was like an extended summer camp. You were 14 yeah. years old. How vivid is your recollection of the, the kinder transport? My recollection is almost um, little episodes. I don't I remember coming home <coughs> still in Tibbetts from school and my mother telling me we were going to park because the Germans would be in Tibbetts the following morning. I have no recollection of getting to park. I remember being at park. I remember my father telling me we were getting out because the Germans would sooner or later get back. But I don't remember any continuation. I remember being in England, and we were with a group of kids. I had somewhere from home. We were all part of the Jewish Zionist youth movement. And it was like an extended summer camp. And then reality sort of crept in the war broke out. We were evacuated up to South Wales and then to North Wales. And after a while, I realized it was going to go on forever. So I decided I might do something and I went into nursing. But if, when did you realize that you were not going to see your parents? That you were the sole survivor of your immediate family? It was a Sunday afternoon. It was at the hospital. I was by then a senior nurse. And the senior nurse would be off at 4.30 on Sunday. <clears throat> and one of the assistant patients came up and she said, Oh, Miss Redding, I'm so sorry. And I wondered, what is she sorry about? Because if I got into trouble, why should she be sorry? <laughs> <laughs> and then she took this piece of newspaper out. It, it was the Allied had got into Bergen-Belsen. They had freed the first concentration camp. And of course, she knew that my parents were in continental Europe. And I think it's then that I realized, uh, oh, it was probably was in the back of my mind anyway. But I couldn't avoid it, that I would most probably never see them again. The horror of what they had gone through, I had no idea. But um, it's very much when I said to Miss Richards, no, I don't want to go over to my room, I'll stay and I'm off at 4.30 anyway. Um, it's easier to cope with situations that you can, how you feel, how you can cope with them then. The things that you can't cope with. And that's what I've done all my life. I put someone in the back of my mind and I hope that door will never open. I don't know other people have other coping mechanisms, but that has been mine. If I can do something about a situation, I will. If I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. I have to accept it. And when did you realize that you owed your survival this English guy who organized the kinder. Well, actually, we sort of heard about it when we were in England again, you know, at Great Engine Farm first. Because also, I owed, we owed, there were almost just beside 10,000 kids actually, who were saved by the kinder transport, 660 some by the Czech kinder transport. But the kinder transport existed before. There were children from Germany, then from Austria, and then from Czechoslovakia. And um, again, it's almost frightening when I, you know, when I think about it now to think that I'm one of 660-some kids. You know, all the others did not survive. I mean, I'm here also because of a sense of um, duty and obligation and great gratitude 
Because to be honest, I'd much rather sit out there than sit up here. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been very, very fortunate. I've been fortunate that I survived, that my parents loved me enough, I was an only child, to let me go. That Adassa used Aliyah sponsored me because every child on the kinder transport had to have a sponsor. And, um, and I could imagine what it is for parents to put a 14 year old child on the train and say goodbye, not knowing, not really knowing when, when they'll see her again. You know, it's something having children of my own must be the most agonizing thing you can do. So consequently, I owe, I really owe a great um, gratitude to so many conditions, to my parents, to Nikki Whitten, to use Aliyah, and my friends here. I've had a very, very easy and great life. Have I deserved it? I surely don't know. <laughs> but I definitely have had it, and I'm extremely grateful. And here I see so many of my friends, and they're extremely dear to me, and I'm so lucky to have them. Did you ever meet Nicholas Winter? <coughs> See, I left Canada. I left Canada. I left Canada. Oh, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I met my late husband in Edmonton. I think it was probably was 43. I was a nursing student at that time. And then I came to Canada in 46. I was not really all that much aware of um, what had gone on. And I didn't really know too much about the kinder transport and there are a couple of kinder transport associations, one in Britain, one in the States, because we were mining people. And you certainly don't know anything about the kinder transport wealth we see or an Elliot Lake for that matter, and that was a metropolis. <laughs> so, um, it was my absolute, um, I don't know, um, stubbornness, I guess, because I could have easily been absorbed into my new life. But to me, my Judaism was always extremely important, and the very fact that I owed so much of my survival to people who made it possible, to me, the most important thing now is not so much what happened in the past. We must remember it. We must never forget it, but we can't live in the past. We have to live in the future. And the future to me is the existence of us as a people. And again, I may be stepping on some toes. To me, the existence of Israel is an extreme. And that's why I don't mind talking about this. What I find, sort of the singular thing that I take away and I find so fascinating about the whole Winton story is that in the time, in the midst of such extraordinary evil, this is a wonderful story about the power of goodness. And that's not always an easy thing to find. This, I think, is one of the most important things. Now, it wasn't at the same time that we met once before. It was also in Toronto, and it was at a synagogue. I can't remember which one, and they had an evening in honor of Nicky Winton. And his son was there with his partner. And um, I said to him, you know, what was it like once you found out being the son of a hero? And his partner piped up and she said, you know, this, I think his son's name is Nicholas. <coughs> so that's what actually brought Nikki and me together. We were at the dinner party, we were talking, and she said, I heard his story, and then I told him mine. Her mother, they were from Hungary. Her mother had been, was a well-known dancer or singer, I don't remember what. And she had a salon where she had invited some of the German officers do because upstairs she was you got the story no, no. Up, upstairs she was sheltering some Jews in trying to get them out of Hungary. 
there are so many stories we don't know anything about. <laughs> and people who have saved lives, sometimes with great danger to themselves. I think those are the stories we must remember. Every bit as much, if not more, than the hearts. And the fact that for 50 years, that scrapbook remained in the attic, and he never said anything. Well, did you hear what he had said, apparently, when somebody said, you didn't even tell your wife? And he said, did you tell your wife everything? <laughs> Thank you so much. 